and the MCT have one or two radio or television programs for children during this period for them to continue learning. Usually, most of these programs are for senior, most of them are for secondary school students, whereas uh, there are a few of them for primary school students, uh, pupils or students as well. So um, I would like another of our guests to join us to add more to from what I just, from the point I just uh, stopped now. We have with us um, Professor Francesca Aladigiano. She is the she's a professor of science education at Obafemi Awolowo University, Ilefe, and she's also the uh, the and the chair of the Ekiti State Universal Basic Education Board. So she will be sharing with sharing with us insights on how learning has continued from our end there during this period for children. Prof. Ma. Please unmute your mic. Unmute your mic first. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, ma. I've been trying to unmute you. I don't know what's going on here. Please unmute your mic. Okay. All right. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma. Good afternoon. Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Well, um, I followed the discussion all along. One addition that I would like to make about all the things we have said is that some of the things we are doing now on radio, I wouldn't want to agree that they are just remote teaching because there are various forms of e-learning platforms. There are the sophisticated ones like Coursera, video streaming, YouTube, podcasts. But when you are also teaching, doing formal teaching, and bringing in educational technology, is still e-learning. Because whatever you're doing, and technology comes into it, and you can stream it to many of your students, constitute um, e-learning. Because they're not learning directly from you face to face in the classroom. For us in the Kitty State, in Subeb specifically, and in the Ministry of Education, we are dealing largely with public schools. And most of our pupils, our students, are not privileged to have a option to reach most of our students at this time is to teach on radio. And the way we do it makes it participatory and uh, uh, active learning. And the way it goes is that we have our teacher taking the lesson for some 20 minutes, slow, Study explanation, and in the meantime, we had uh, sensitized students of time of broadcast. And so, shortly before the broadcast starts, we have our jingle that calls our students to class, and we expect them to be seated with their notebooks, with their pencils. And uh, from my experience, many of them have been joined by their parents. As soon as we finish the 20 minute teaching, we then have the phone in program where students can ask questions about what is not clear. Teacher also will ask questions and expect pupils to respond. And to our amazement, we have had very, very good responses. In the last uh, five weeks, we've had over 500 phone calls, phoning in. And we could have had more if we have time. And very important, before we close them, we give them take home to do the assignments. And when we start in lesson, the next lesson, we start off from previous knowledge by, by attending to the home assignment. And we try to make students get in where I have interest in the sense that if you call in many times, we give some little rewards. We 
I announced to uh, pupils that are doing well. And so we now find competition or even in terms of pupils phoning in. This is our special way in Ekiti of getting our pupils and our secondary school students busy in spite of the lockdown. And to add that we are also referring to their regular textbooks that they use in class so that they could go back to all of this. Uh, thank you very much. Will... No. Thank you very much, Marada. Yes. We'll, we'll come back to you later. Um, okay. some, uh, one of the, some of, I've seen some comments about whether this program is, being, is on YouTube now. As I said earlier, it will be available on YouTube later. Not at the moment. It's not available now. We'll post on YouTube later. Um, one of our commenters, uh, Mr. Abdurazak Akonji, says, I was asking Prof, I think that at that time it was Professor Yusuf that was speaking. Professor Yusuf said something about, was trying to differentiate e-learning, uh, digital learning, online learning, online teaching. So this person wants further clarification on that vis-a-vis -vis remote learning and distance learning. Professor Yusuf, sir, in short sentences, or in a short sentence, just help us differentiate all this. <laughs> Okay, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank our prof, Professor Ladeja, the wife of my Oga in OAU. So, greetings to my Oga. One of you said, Pupi, was saying there was on, on here today. Now, the, the clarification digital learning is so simple. When you are talking about digital learning, you are talking of using digital devices of different forms for learning. You can also use analog devices. There are so many of them. For instance, now if you are using a fire projector or you are using a big projector, those are analog projectors. But when you are using the LCD, that is liquid crystal display projector, you are using digital devices. So that one is clear. E learning, e learning, like I said, is electronic learning. It can be online. It can be recorded. In fact, e-learning can work anywhere. You don't need to have internet anywhere to, uh, to work with e-learning. If, if you have internet access, it's a plus. For instance, you can package everything in a course. There are universities in the world. That was what they were doing before this pandemic. They will package everything in a CD, give it to students, and then uh, it will have audio, it will have uh, textual, it will have uh, video, and they will learn. And then they will, and they, and they will uh, go through it. The online learning is from the aspect of students, those who are learners. And we talk about that one in terms of uh, learner-centered learning. Then the online teaching, we are talking of facilitators, who people call now teachers. Because online teaching is, uh, uh, is not like on-site teaching. Online teaching, you don't need to the will. There are so many things. For instance, now, if I want to teach a course in my discipline, EduTech, what I need to do is to look for the resources globally. I will create links. I will have on, um, on my page, on Canvas, on Moodle, on Google uh, Classroom. I ask students to go there. They will read. They will come back to my platform and they will do this. So, now, just to clarify, um, emergency remote learning is not an aberration. It's part of the system of education globally. When there is crisis, medically, if there is crisis, you be emergency issue. That's what is happening also. In fact, you can decide to, you can use everything you use regularly. But anybody who is prepared before now for online teaching, in fact, emergency will just fit into it. That's just the clarification. Okay. Okay, talking about preparation, we, in Nigeria, we should know that in a, across at the tertiary education level, we could, I could not find any statistics for other levels of education, but at the university, from the NUC, data from the NUC shows that 87 Nigerian universities are able to offer internet, uh, internet um, what you call Wi-Fi, internet service 24 hours daily. <laughs> Only 87 Nigerian <laughs> universities are able to do that. I think that's one of the major things, one of, one of the major utilities that will be useful for e-learning or for online learning to take place. 
<laughs> Mr. Amo, yes, sir. Let me clarify this. Yes, sir. I'm talking as a specialist in the field of education. Yes. I was also privileged to be the director of ICT in my university uh, for see. two years. I was I was the director of, of uh, Institute of Education, so I can give you information. All right, sir. The fact is that the standard globally is that for 1,000 people, you should have one gig bandwidth. No university in Nigeria subscribe to two gig. No university. Repeat one and you have no Repeat. university in Nigeria. Okay. You subscribe to two gig. And you have 43,000 students. You have 5,000 staff or, or more. Then, then you are going to distribute it for that with 24 hours. How will that work? You see, you must look at the, you see, there is an issue in terms of uh, online learning. There is what we call, uh, what we call the elements of online learning. Modality is one of the elements. For instance, now, you want to teach online, you can teach using online materials. You also teach in the classroom. You can use blended, there are three approaches. It can be fully online. So that is one. Then issue of access we are talking about is one of them. No university in Nigeria here has the bandwidth that is required to have what we call quality, I can say it, quality online teaching. None in Nigeria. No. You see, we are trying. You see, yeah, you see, the fact is this. The fact is this. You, ca you can ask universities in terms of their subscription. In fact, it is even bad in terms of not just universities now, polytechnics and colleges of education. Some of us, we don't even go straight to the providers. We go through third party. Mm. So the bandwidth is so expensive. So if you subscribe to, instead of going straight to MTN, to Glow, to Airtel, mm -hmm. we go through a third party. It comes four times the price we should pay. So instead of now subscribing for four gig or more, we are forced to maybe subscribe to uh, for one STM one or two STM one or three STM one you know, or four or five ahead of the day, which is less than one gig for a university. Any productive work cannot be done when you have more than 2,000 staff who are using like two gig, uh, like one gig at most. The recommendation for American University is 1,000 for one gig. But let's say we are lesser. Let's move it to three. That means if you have a university with a population of like 45,000 staff and students, you must have what now? Divide three. And then you can know uh, by three. You can know the number of gigs you should have. No university has that capacity. We are trying. We must acknowledge this. But we, we need to invest critically in the area of access. But like... Uh, Professor Adeko, you the, the, the prof, professor, yes, Professor Adeko, you from uh, Gumbi said, you see, there are things we need to do. I won't recommend for any university or secondary school, primary school, what we call 100% synchronous online learning. It should be maybe like 10 minutes uh, synchronous where you are going to use video. It should be something you will develop earlier, you put on site for students, they will go there, they will retrieve. You can use your WhatsApp, you can use your LMS, you can use other uh, uh, platforms. But then your video should not be more than five minutes. The reason is this, where is the bandwidth? If you don't have 4G to download ordinary 10 MB, you are going to have problem. These are the issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I would like one of our, one of the participants to ask a question. Mr. Mubarak Akintola, it seems you have a question to ask. Mr. Akintola? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mo. I, I think uh, the issue I wanted to raise uh, had already been addressed by Professor Yusuf on uh, the matter of accessibility and uh, available infrastructure, particularly on bandwidth, which he has uh, clearly covered. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Akonji, you also raised your hand earlier. Mr. Abrazak Akonji? Mr. 
It seems that you are you are it seems you are not available now. We'll come back to Mr. Konji later. So we'll proceed with our conversation. Miss Ogunsoya. If you are if you can hear me, what are yes, the factors, I can. All right. What are the factors you consider in determining the platform to use as a teacher? We can't hear you. I can't. I can't hear you here. Okay. Right. Hello. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So there are a few factors to consider as a teacher before um, choosing a platform to use. Um, it has been mentioned already. Internet issues, bandwidth, um, internet network, and all that narrows down some some methods that can be used in learning. So first of all, you must consider the age of your learners. That's the truth. The way you teach a preschooler is different from the way you teach a child in primary school or even a student in secondary school. So the age is critical. There are different um, time frames for concentration for both um, for different ages of children. A child in preschool might not be able to even stay online for up to 10 minutes, 15 minutes because the child is distracted already. A child in primary school can take more than that. A child in secondary school might be able to take, you know, more amount of time so the age is very critical first of all and then to determine the learning platform i think i've mentioned that before the digital literacy skills of both the teachers and the students is essential you must use a learning platform that is easily accessible something that the students can easily navigate through you know in recent times as different innovations are coming up we've seen different people use platforms that are very difficult for the learners to access so you must use a platform that your learners or your students can easily access. All right, thank you very much. One of our guests here, also, as I have mentioned in, in passing earlier, is Professor Josiah, um, Professor um, um, Olusha Gwajiboye. Professor Josiah Olusha Gwajiboye is a CRC and that Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria uh, Registrar and Chief Executive. He's also here with us. So I would like Professor Ajiboye to tell us what is being done to ensure that teachers are able to provide digital uh, learning. Well, thank you very much, uh, Abdul Salam. Uh, I really want to appreciate the uh, speakers. Uh, they have actually en en enriched our understanding of e-learning or online learning as it has, is, is applicable today. and. Uh, uh, with our topic that we are looking at, we are looking at beyond COVID-19, uh, how will Nigeria cope? Uh, and I think uh, it's very clear that our educational system will not remain the same after this COVID-19. Uh, what, what is very clear from all our discussion is that, look, we are, something has to be done, and it has to be done urgently. Look, we have seen all the challenges inherent in online learning, in e-learning. You know, we have seen all the facilities that are required we need gamut of materials and everything to make sure that we run successful online programs. And uh, it's very clear that Nigeria is not there yet. But look, given this experience of the COVID-19, proceeding forward, especially with our teachers, what we are going to do is very clear to us. Look, you know, a large number of these teachers, like I said in the last uh, meeting, about 61.2, uh, 61 about 62 million of teachers globally, uh, Tom presently, about 62 million teachers globally are at home presently, you know, and they could not, you know, a large number of them could not reach their, their children, their learners, especially in Nigeria, you know, in Africa, you know, generally, a large number of them cannot reach their learners. And this poses a very big challenge to us. So definitely, we just have to look at the way we train our teachers, our teacher preparation programs, and also even those who are on the job already who have to be retrained. I always say this, that look, technology will not replace teachers, okay? But teachers who know how to use technology will probably replace those who do not know how to use it. Yes, it is very glaring that the way to go is the way of technology, technology-mediated learning. And that is why Nigeria has to invest a lot of resources, our UBEC, our suburbs, and everything, all of us together, including the Teachers Regional Council of Nigeria. Our focus after uh, post-COVID-19 we have to be the idea of how to ensure that our teachers are trained and retrained. Because, look, you know, we, are, we were caught nappy 
in this circumstance. Uh, and uh, we just have to come out of this and to prepare ourselves very well. And I want to appreciate them again because they, you know, they have all, if we put all these things together, it will help so many governmental agencies, the Federal Ministry of Education, to be able to move forward, and all the state governments to be able to move forward and proceed uh, post COVID 19. All right. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Professor Adipoji. Thank you. Yes, sir. Professor Adipoji, sir. If you are still, I don't know whether you're still here. You can't see. I've yes, not seen I'm you. With you. All right, sir. I uh, would uh, like yeah. you to assist us with this. Um, Some of these e learning platforms are available. And we, we are, they are not created by educationists. Some of them are created by just technology, technology based people or technologists and such set of people or business minded people. So, how do we ensure collaboration between the educators and the creators of this e learning or online learning or whatever case we call it? All these platforms, how do we ensure co um, successful collaboration between our, and among them? Thank you so much. Uh, we still much to go back to what I've earlier mentioned. The only limitation with respect to the usage of ICT facilities to deploy it in any form of education has to do with the imagination of the user. The bulk of the platforms are not primarily designed to cater for teaching and learning, but with resourceful thinking, someone can explore what is in existence to use for the particular purpose. Let's look at the social media. First and foremost, social media are not designed for education, just for social interaction. But I can tell you that a lot of people are creatively making use of different forms of social media for teaching and learning. We have some learning management system platform. Some of them, I want to agree, might have been designed for commercial purpose. Let me refer to Google Classroom as an example. Google Classroom, I wouldn't think is designed for commercial purpose. It's part and parcel of a package by Google, Google for Education, which I want to assume has a lot to do with input from educators. And one interesting thing is that some of them also have facilities for feedback. We want to do it this way, we want to do it this way. But another thing is now, there are two aspects making use of what is in existence without necessarily having to reinvent the wheel. Some are open source. You adjust it like Moodle. You adjust it to suit your own peculiar needs. And some, you just have to reinvent the wheel. But whatever the situation is, I think, first and foremost, educators, just as Professor Ajiboye has rightly said, <laughs> no, no technology will ever replace teachers. But we need input of computer scientists, especially programmers. I'm using Moodle and the one I'm using, one of our students had to look into it. I'm not a programmer, I don't know anything about it. I want some, some this done, I want that done. He did the adjustment based on my own specification. And that is one of the things that can be done. But the major thing is that the user, the instructor, the facilitator, first and foremost, must have an idea of what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, what resources he wants to make use of, and the best way to deliver it. Thank you so much, Mr. Mo. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Olato, yes, sir. Dr. Olato, I would just like you to add them up with some things that parents can also do during this period because most of the time the children are with their parents. How can parents ensure that this e-learning is successful beyond during this period or after? Please I'm almost all right, sir. Like okay, I've done that. I don't know if you are here. You can hear me now. Yeah, proceed. Can you? Uh -huh. First of all, most during this lockdown. The majority of the parents are working with their children. That's in my own district. The reason is that they use their parents' phone 
to do what we call uh, uh, like uh, what Professor Yusuf said, uh, emergency remote learning. Because uh, some of them will even ask questions. I mean, the parents, you understand? So uh, uh, the problem I think we have now at the moment, particularly where I reside and where I, I, I teach or where I do my job, is uh, the problem of data and uh, devices. Because most parents could not afford that uh, data. Because if you are going to use any of these uh, electronic devices that involve internet, there is no way you will not talk about data. So, uh, uh, and also the phone they are using, now we use phone. In my own area, we use phone. We the, some of those parents use smartphone or iPhone. So they have to be supportive with the school. Otherwise, there won't be any uh, meaningful uh, learning. I think that's my own contribution. Okay. And hello? Uh, hello? The parent must be supportive with the decision of the districts okay. in order to, to make the learning more meaningful. Because right now, they cannot go to school. I'm also Ministry of Education said we should not start uh, teaching of thought time. So what we do all along is to do revision of the previous work being done. We get it now. Mm -hmm. And if they don't make all these uh, devices, particularly phone, and they buy, they have to buy data. That's how the teacher can communicate with their children. I mean, the subject teachers. So they need to be supportive, the parents, with the, with the school authority. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And Professor Yusuf shared with us one article he wrote about five days ago on the experience of using e-learning during this period and beyond. So you can you can click on the link to read through it. Um, or I would like um, Professor Aladdin Jenner to come back. She was saying some things earlier about some efforts going on over there in Ekiti State. Professor.